king. Hi, Tolu. Oh, hello. Hi, 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 Daniel. How are you? All right, all right. No idea whether anyone else can hear us. I hope not. <laughs> How are you doing? All right. Um, a little bit too frantic, actually. Yeah. You know, when you get to that point where you think, okay, some things have to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More than you uh... are. <laughs> More than you know. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Uh, this is the technician from Bonn. Um, you are still online. As the world is watching you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to know. We can't see the world. Um, you see it in the Heidi and Tolula, upper right If corner. you can hear us, can this you please mute yourself? Podium. Thank you. Uh, no. They from don't your seem side to be is, able to hear us. Uh, the stream. Can you hear us? We can hear you. Multiple people. <laughs> oh. If you please switch uh, off your cameras. They they hear multiple um, people. Until is it better now? Until you're on your. Uh, uh, until it's yours to to speak. Thank you.
Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to the side event on accelerating climate and SDG synergies as an available enabler for just transition. My name is Bahar Sayedi. I am a Senior Sustainable Development Officer at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and I have the pleasure of moderating our conversation today on behalf of the organizers UNDASA and UNFCCC. Uh, before I pass it on to my colleague Daniele for his opening remarks, let me just share a few words about why we wanted to have this conversation today um, in Bonn. Um, so just as a background, UNFCCC and UNDESA have been looking at this topic of climate and SDG synergies from 2019. We have been convening a number of global dialogues, um, the last of which happened last year in July. That was the third global conference on climate and SDG synergies. And throughout these dialogues, there's two main issues that keep emerging and arising. One is the importance of building the evidence base. And with that, um, we have been looking at the evidence um, that suggests uh, if we pursue integrated solutions and joint up approaches, there will be co development co-benefits. However, um, the quality and the quantity of data varies across center sectors, and uh, they are also scattered all over the place. There's some studies here and there, and there is no global resource for policy making makers on this topic. Um, and that's why recently UNDESA and UNFCCC launched a dedicated expert group to look at this topic more closely to see what do we know, what evidence do we have, where are the gaps, and what do we need to do uh, to, to do this better. And today we have with us the co-leads of the expert group on climate and SDG synergies. They will have uh, an opportunity to share their work, what they're doing right now, what do they plan to achieve, um, and hopefully uh, this session will provide some good feedback on that. Um, and then the second issue that keeps coming up is the importance of just transition, equity, um, and fairness. Now this is becoming the top of, um, rising to the top of the agenda, both within the intergovernmental processes on the SDGs and intergovernmental processes related to climate. So here we want to ask, how can this work on climate and SDG synergies enable um, just transition? Does it enable it? And if so, um, how do we build the evidence for that? And that's why we have uh, an exciting panel of experts with us who um, w are going to share their experiences um, on that subject in particular. Now, with that, let me hand it over to my colleague, Daniele Violetti, who's the senior director here at UNFCCC, um, to provide us his opening remarks. Daniele, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barre, uh, colleagues, panelists, uh, and welcome to all of you who are here in person and online. I, I see uh, participation online. So, uh, pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, side event, uh, uh, really focusing uh, on accelerating uh, climate and SDG synergies uh, um, as an enabler for just transition. Um, referring to the just transition part, uh, I think that uh, our last conference made it very clear uh, among the various key messages coming out of that, uh, um, that just transition should be at the center of uh, integrated policy and program planning uh, and implementation. Uh, and, and I think, uh, in a way, this was advancing a lot of the discussion that followed uh, last year, because we ended up uh, uh, with uh, one of the success of COP27 was really the agreement in the final uh, uh, cover decision of uh, launching the work for a uh, um, just transition work program. And in fact, actually, here in Bonn, uh, this week, uh, the negotiation for that have started for the first time, uh, and following that in the, in the, in the negotiating room, uh, they are moving quite fast, uh, and, and uh, very, very rich discussion, uh, and, and uh, the co-facilitators have produced already a couple of iterations of an informal note that, if you see it, it's really, really already indicating elements around the scope, modalities uh, uh, for the work of, that should be then a work program <laughs> adopted at COP28. So it's, it's this discussion is it's very important, will continue to be, and, and uh, again, the linkages between uh, uh, climate and SDGs, so the Paris Agreement goals uh, and the SDGs, it's, it's over and over uh, picked up everywhere for the use of policy 
makers so that the implementation at the national level really rely on, on these important aspects. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue to look into this uh, and the second point that uh, Barry <coughs> mentioned uh, to have really some uh, sound and, and, uh, and solid uh, information base uh, on, on this uh, and preparing the first ever um, Global Synergies Report on Climate Action and the SDG. So this is the additional effort that we are working together, uh, which we believe will be an important um, source of information and reference uh, as we move along in, in this conversation. Uh, of course, uh, we'll, uh, we'll move now to the next and fourth uh, global conference, uh, which will take place in July in New York, and I'm sure you, you will hear more about that. Uh, so also to testify that as we move uh, along, we will continue to engage on this important topic, which is also for us in the climate change process um, really becoming more and more uh, important. So, um, you know, the panel is, is as you said, uh, plenty of distinguished uh, speakers who so share experiences and, and, and views on our mood. So, um, yeah, I can stop here. Thank you again for being here. And Barre, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anneli. And I know you're very busy and have to um, get going, but appreciate uh, your opening remarks. And we look forward to um, continue working with UNFCCC on this topic. Um, I will provide some information on the fourth global conference that's happening in July at the end of the session. Um, now let me turn to our colleagues of the Climate and um, SDG Synergies Expert Group, uh, Mr. Luis Gomez Echeverri. He is the Emirates uh, Research Scholar of the International Institute for Applied Systems Science Analysis. And we have Ms. Heidi Heckman, who's the Director of Future Africa from University of Pretoria. Um, Luis and Heidi, the floor is yours. And Heidi is joining us virtually. <coughs> Yeah, now it's working. Uh, as the coordinator of the SP, so it's nice to be back home. Anyway, we will keep our presentation to some 15 minutes. Um, we have our co-lead, Heide Hackman. She's online, and she will come in. I will do some 10 minutes, and then I will pass it on to, to Heide to, uh, to talk, and I will say in a minute what she will talk about. So I will concentrate on doing some introductory remarks what our plan is, what's the scope of the report, why is it needed, why is it urgent, why now, what is the focus, and some of the preliminary messages that they are coming up. We're just at the starting sp uh, stage, but I think it, we thought that it was important in any case to already feature it here in the SP sessions to get some feedback from all of you. We're aiming to complete the report by the end of July. I'll put the... Um, the, by the end of July, but before I get to that, our report is led uh, to co leads, but we have a group of experts, some 13 experts uh, from different parts of the world, different institutions from different regions. So it's a, it's, these are people who have been working a lot either on climate change or SDGs or both uh, from the IPCC, from IGES, from uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute, et cetera. So, so I think it's very well represented. Um, uh, we will try to finish, we will finish the report at the end of, at the end of July. Um, and, uh, and we, yeah, so I'll just stop it there. Let me get to already to the scope of the report. The scope of the report, um, uh, we will, sorry, uh, just to, so yeah, I think it's better if I stand over here. Um, we are going to build on the Global Conf Climate and SDG Synergies Conference, the third one that took place in Tokyo. But as, as our uh, Bahare had told us, this builds already 
on a conference that started in 2019 in Copenhagen, two webinars that took place during the COVID area, during the COVID time, and then, and then the, the uh, Tokyo conference, the third global conference. And that will be the one that we are focusing on in order to build on it because the, a lot of recommendations already came up from this report, from this conference already. Bahari has mentioned a couple of them. Uh, this, then our report is also going to look at the, at collecting a lot of a lot of literature, a lot of evidence because that was what the third global conference had suggested that we should do. We're going to look at the literature. We are already looking at the literature, the science, uh, the scientific literature, the great literature, the anecdotal uh, experiences, so we can build out. Um, we are looking at the policies that our that our countries are using, either intentionally or on or accidentally creating synergies between SDGs and and climate, and we're looking also at the reporting mechanisms, uh, like the NDCs, VNR and other reporting mechanisms, uh, which I think we feel, and I will talk a little bit about that in a minute, that we feel that if they are, if they are strengthened and they can be really more systematized in order to, to, to look at synergies, that that will be much more um, yeah, conducive to helping accelerate what we are all aiming to do, uh, the implementation of both the climate, the Paris Agreement, and the and the Agenda 2030, and that by combining synergies between the two, that the, that the, um, the implementation will not only be accelerated, be more successful, et cetera. We're also going to talk about a little bit about uh, how we can increase the ambition for policymakers, and Heidi Hackman, who is online, will be talking about the analytical framework that we're planning to, to work on um, during the next <coughs> six weeks, um, and why that is important um, uh, in order to help policymakers to to advance synergies, to promote synergies, and then a set of conclusions and recommendations that uh, that will be that will be given to 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 not only for policymakers but all stakeholders, uh, and hopefully will be practical recommendations. And one of the things that we're hoping is that this report, which we're doing in a, in a relatively short period of time, that we are creating the foundation for a much more rigorous report that will be starting after September of this year um, to work towards something that is more much rigorous, much more scientific, and that will be one of the main recommendations or the main contributions to the uh, summit for the future and other of, of 2024, which is building up to be such an important, such an important event, but also other other events. But for this one, it will be more for the SDG summit, for the climate ambition of the Secretary General summit, and for the COP28 in Dubai. Um, so very quickly, why is this report needed? And I think our our moderator already uh, alluded to it. Much, much talk about the importance of synergies, uh, the need to enhance the co-benefits, avoid the trade-offs, but relatively little action. Um, and how can this problem be addressed? We'll be addressing that as solutions in our report. Um, increasing the recognition that synergies can result in win-win situations, but the evidence is scattered all over the place as uh, Bahare has already mentioned. Um, is it necessary, perhaps, to create a platform uh, where all this information can be much more systematically accessed, can be much more readily available to, to policymakers? The answer is, of course, uh, if that is so important. The absence of tools, uh, and there we'll be talking why the analytical framework. Uh, there, there, there are many tools that are being used right now to look at the at interlinkages, SDGs, uh, even interlinkages between um, SDGs and climate, but but not as not as systematic as they should be, and that's why we're working on something that is that we're calling the analytical framework, for a lack of a better term, 
but the idea is to create something that is relatively simple and easy for policymakers to use, to promote, to advance, to enhance synergies. How can finance be reformed to advance the agenda? There is a, a very, very important debate taking place this year and next on the urgency to reform the global architecture of finance. And here we're talking about the MDBs, the World Bank, the private sector, the banks, uh, et cetera. Um, we feel that, that in this debate of the, of the reform of the financial architecture, this topic of advancing synergies has to be included. As we're looking at many of the evidence that we're taking a look, what we find is that the, the finance is really not that much being used in order to increase and to enhance synergies. It should be. And, but how can we make it easier for policymakers to do, to do that? The adequacy, or rather the inadequacy of the reporting mechanisms, as far as the, as the synergies are concerned, and here we're focusing mostly on, on the NDCs. Uh, one of the panelists, uh, one of our panelists, has done a lot of work on this, and, and I'm glad that he will be. He will be talking more about this. But you know, if 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 synergies are so important, why is it that we're not making the NDCs and the, the reporting of synergies a prerequisite? Uh, we th we think that it should be, but of course. This is for parties to decide, but I think that this is something that if we create the, if we create the good, the good uh, um, rationale and and the reasons why this should happen, perhaps this could happen. Uh, and how can the how can the topics of just transitions, leaving no one behind, and equality be given a higher a higher attention that it has been in the past? So. You will, when you hear one of the presenters, something that we're finding out is that there is a lot, a lot of co-benefits that are being that are being reported on uh, and being quantified. But when it comes to the social ones and on these issues, is very very weak. And we want to to find a way not only to highlight that this is not happening and that we need to do it, but also so that we can so that we can. Um, what am I hoping in here? Oops. Uh, again, this has already been said, building on the on the recommendations of the of the global conference of the third one, especially, and the main recommendations that came from that from that report uh, or from that conference was that we need to strengthen the evidence, and that is the main one, which has already been also mentioned by Bahare. Um, that we need to enhance integrated planning, uh, that if we're talking about synergies between uh, SDGs and climate, that we should be given a lot more attention to integrated planning systems approach and addressing all of this together. Uh, the, scaring, the, the importance of scaling up capacity building and the sharing of good practices, um, that is obviously an obvious one, but what we're finding out, especially now that we've been doing a lot of literature research, is that what the reason that much of this is not happening is that the, the capacities at the country level are very weak, and, and this needs to be addressed and rather urgently. Um, developing and promoting partnerships for transformations. Uh, again, these things will happen, integrated planning, um, enhancing synergies only by having stakeholders, different sectors, and groups working together uh, in order to make this, this happening. And then informing, an inter informing key intergovernmental processes on climate and SDGs. Uh, this I'm going to just mention very, very briefly because this is something that we will be working, hopefully for this report initiated, but maybe for the next one, is that we want to work on a, on a global um, uh, interactive map where you can go to the country, look at what it's doing, some of the best case studies. And there's a website there on something that IGES, which is one of the partners of our, of our project. Um, and what we like to do is to do one for the whole world uh, um, with the help of everyone. Uh, but uh, that's work to be done. 
Um, this uh, I will skip so we can get uh, um, uh, on this I already mentioned a little bit. Uh, what are some of the things that are standing in the way of, of, of the work that needs to be done in terms of enhancing synergies on the knowledge? Um, there's, again, and this I'm repeating a little bit, but I think it's important is that there is insufficient knowledge and it's not organized knowledge, and we need to address that, that we need uh, that there is an unavailability of methodologies and tools for advancing synergies uh, and the challenge of reconciling climate action and, and, and certain SDGs. On the economic side, um, and that one is, is one that we're finding it, that it really needs a lot of attention, is that there is really limited uh, national budgeting or public budgeting for addressing synergies and the lack of, financial of, of enabling financial instruments. And that's why we say that if we're going to be looking at the, this year on the reform of the financial architecture, this is one of the key things that we need to talk about and the lack of clarity on the benefits and the costs of synergies. They need to be much more emphasized. And here they need to be quantified, they need to be put in terms of dollar and cents. And then the political, of course, uh, is, is that the political cycles is the same thing that we find not only for the, for the synergies, but for everything else, that when, when, when political uh, when policy terms. So, I'm not, I'm not going to go into this, but because I want to to now uh, switch pretty quickly to our co-lead on to to present us on the analytical framework. But we are collecting a lot of case studies uh, with entry points on the SDGs one, two, three, four, five, six. Some of the climate action and the synergy, and the case studies to 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 take a look and to show that what is happening. We will do the same also on the end with the entry points of climate. Uh, so this will be quite rich, quite a rich um, report. Uh, uh, here are some examples and best practices. This, I suppose, is being shared online so you can take a look at. I don't need to go into this. Now I would like to, to, to switch over to, to Heide Hackman, who is online, who will talk a, to talk through us talk to us about uh, the analytical framework. Heide, over to you. Thank you, Lewis. I trust that you can hear and see me um, and that I can rely on you to advance the slides. Um, so colleagues, I apologize for not being with you in person, but um, uh, good to be part of this session. In terms of the brief that we've been given as outlined by Lewis, Perhaps the most challenging task, notwithstanding the huge amount of work uh, to create that evidence base, is the request for us to propose what is being called an analytical framework that policymakers in particular can use in order to advance, accelerate, amplify synergistic action. This task immediately raises two questions. What do we mean by a framework and do we need yet another one? So the three slides that I want to present focus on providing you with just some very, very early ideas in response to those two questions. Ideas that have come out of initial discussions that we've had with one of the senior experts we've engaged to support the panel's work and ideas that still need to be workshopped and revised by our panel of experts. So your critical reflections today on these very preliminary ideas would also be most welcome. So the first thing to say really is that the ambition is to build on but move beyond a focus on how to identify synergy. So there are tools and methods available for doing that, as Lewis has indicated. And what we have in mind is perhaps a more strategic guide to action, if you will. One that provides a structured, integrated approach to dealing with complex information, making informed decisions, monitoring action and communicating outcomes. At this stage, we are thinking is that this framework should comprise at least three key pillars. And taken together, I think, um, initial ideas about those three pillars, which I'll briefly sketch for you, speak to the recommendations of the third global conference on synergies. So the first and critical pillar, back to the previous slide, Lewis. 
you're too fast for me. The first pillar is about articulating the common vision for action that we're talking about. This is one that not only, this vision not only has to make the case convincingly for synergistic action, but perhaps more importantly, it needs to embed such action in the explicit pursuit of transformation. Action that informs and supports profound systems change, including change to the social institutions that perpetuate today's unsustainable and inequitable trends. Articulating that vision is easy, so we will also need to provide the basis of a more concrete guide to what one might call transformative synergistic action. Next slide, please, Lewis. In this regard, we are currently looking at existing, and I must say, much more generic frameworks for how one advances transformations. And what these frameworks tell us about levels of intervention in systems or what have been called shallow and deep leverage points for transformation from the relatively practical or mechanistic interventions to the relational dynamics of systems of interactions and to those interventions also in the domain of values of worldviews that ultimately determine a system's direction of travel, its future trajectory, the transformational level. The idea we want to explore, and as reflected in this very simplistically uh, outlined diagram, is the possibility of ad adapting these transformations frameworks with entry points, leverages for transformation, in order to develop a framework that will enable us to also at the same time identify, review and evaluate the transformative potential of synergistic actions. With a framework like that in place, we then realized that we would also need to develop concrete recommendations around two further pillars of the framework. Next slide, please, Lewis. So I do not have time to go into these at all, but the slide gives you a sense of, of what might be entailed. Suffice it to say that the second pillar would be about identifying a set of what you might think of as essential underlying principles and associated imperatives that have to inform decision-making processes and practice. Um, and we can debate what these are, what they include, um, but this gives you a sense of the kind of thinking, you know, around equitable partnership, issues of inclusivity, diversity of decision-making processes would also clearly be um, key. And then secondly, we would need to think about very concrete recommendations about what one might think of as being essential cross-cutting support priorities or what we would call critical fields of action, which you see again listed here and again, which coincide with many of the high-level recommendations that have previously been made in this discussion and synergistic action space. So, colleagues, thank you for your attention. I do hope there is something in these preliminary ideas that stimulates new thinking, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Back to you, Lewis. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi. And I think with, with that is we have covered, we, there are a couple of more slides on definitions of co-benefits and the definitions of synergies and trade-offs that I will not go into it, that I think is more there for people to take a look and and actually criticize, give us, give us inputs, uh, because we thought that it was going to be easy just saying what the definitions are, and then we started looking, and people define it in many, many different ways. And I think we need to, uh, to, we're trying to focus on one that is good for the report, and I think that's why we included that. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much to Luis and Heidi for the excellent presentation. I hope that you got a sense of what uh, we're trying to achieve here, why it's important. And in terms of the specific timelines, as Luis mentioned, um, we are hoping to arrive at an advanced copy by July and hopefully the launch of this first global report on climate and SDG synergies will take place in September of this year with the idea that this will form the basis for a more comprehensive one coming in 2024. Now, before I turn to my panel, let me just ask you one very quick question. How many of you are involved or know of the VNRs? 
two people. So that's very much expected in the climate talks. VNRs are the voluntary um, national reviews. It's the sort of sort of the NDCs of the SDG world. Um, but if you sit in the um, intergovernmental processes related to SDGs, if I say how many people know about the NDCs, I expect the same number of hands. So this is what we're talking about here. Um, we do have two very separate sort of communities uh, working on very connected issues. And what we're trying to do, uh, we're trying to break the silos here and bring them together uh, because we do see that evidence shows bringing these two together will uh, help us uh, work on climate action and the SDGs more effectively. So that's why we're here. Um, now let me turn to my panel here. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, to my right here, I have um, Kave Gilampur, who's the Vice President for International Strategy, Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Kave is also one of the members of the expert group on climate and SDG synergies. Um, and then to my left, um, I'll start with Addis, um, who is the research fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and then um, next to um, Addis is, um, is Christy Wong. She is a youth delegate of the UNFCCC from Hong Kong. Um, we have Claire Weissen. Um, she is the team leader of the mitigation pathway analysis and co-head of the climate policy team. And online, I have Ms. Tolula Oni. She is the clinical director of research uh, from the University of Cambridge. She's also the founder of um, Urban Better. So thanks everyone for joining this panel and just building on what uh, Luis and Heidi have um, presented and also going in the direction of the two issues that this report is focusing on. One is accumulating experiences. What do we know already? What are we seeing or not seeing? Um, and then the second is how do we go forward? What is the forward thinking uh, framework that we want to develop and give a direction to the world um, on this topic? Um, so let me, let me start with Kave here, you are a familiar face in the climate negotiations. How do you see this conversation on climate and SDGs coming in the climate dialogues? Or not coming? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bahari. Um, actually, your, your question to the audience, uh, the, the response stole a lot of the things I was going to say or illustrated <laughs> it. So I'm very much part of this community, very much on the climate side of things. I do know what a VNR is, but, uh, but that's probably the, the limit of my expertise on that side. So, I mean, I think the, the, that is, illustrates the, the, the problem. And in New York on the SDGs, you have the, the mirror image in terms of a lack of awareness of what's going on in climate, and that needs to really change. From my perspective, I'm quite frustrated as, uh, as someone who's been in the negotiations for a long time. Often we negotiate decisions. Uh, and the, then at the, at the last moment, people throw in references to the SDGs almost as an afterthought, and they, you know, the mantra of leaving no one behind. But there's no substance to that or actionable outcomes that really mean anything uh, from, from my perspective that have come out of, the, of this sort of negotiating process. So that's the slightly uh, depressing um, uh, sort of perspective of it, but there's also lots of opportunities to fix that. So first of all, there's the coincidence of needing to halve emissions in this critical decade, which is the, uh, the sort of mantra that the UN Secretary General ha really came up with that and has been pushing it. And of course, 2030 is also uh, you know, a key milestone for the SDGs. Uh, also, I think that the issue of development is a, a very obvious uh, potential common ground within the climate negotiations, because both ministers and negotiators from developed and developing countries emphasize the importance of climate to the issue of development. So I think it's a, an area that can bring people together, which is important. This year is the year of the global stock take. I think that can be used to very much exploit, uh, to be exploited to uh, operationalize these synergies between climate and SDGs. And there's this notion emerging, I mean, Daniel is left, but the, the executive secretary and others are talking about 2024 being an important year of response to the outcome of COP28 and the GST. And again, you've mentioned the, you know, the, the summit that will be happening then. And finally, I would just say there's lots of vehicles that 
could be used within this process to make those synergies happen. There's the GST COP28 outcome. There's the long-term development strategies. If a country is serious about achieving net zero by 2050, then the strategy to do that is effectively the country's development strategy. It's impossible to separate them. There's the NDCs, there's the global goal on adaptation, there's the new collective quantified goal on finance, there's the just transition work program. All of these work processes in the climate negotiations that are ongoing could be utilized to make those synergies happen. Thank you. Excellent, thanks for that, Kave. And, and, and it's really good to hear that there's concrete opportunities um, to inject uh, more systematically this conversation around synergies with the SDGs. Um, now let me uh, turn to you, Tolula. Tolula Oni, she's also part of the expert group um, and more focused on the social side. So Tolula, over to you for your perspectives. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'll just share some reflections. Uh, so. I come from, a, I work at the intersection of health and health and, and climate, so I'm coming from a health background and maybe one of the people that are completely in that interstitial space. Um, so I want to focus on health and explore that from the perspective of um, the SDGs and then from the perspective of climate and just to highlight what the opportunity is here and really where we're heading and, uh, and some of the opportunities we've, which we've taken advantage of and some of which um, is to come. So from, uh, from, a, from an SDG perspective, we often think about um, health quite simply as SDG three, right? Uh, because there is a, there is a direct uh, goal of, of, um, of health and well-being, and related to that, the targets around neonatal maternal health, around infectious diseases, around non-communicable diseases, uh, but also around safety um, and, and pollution, air pollution um, or environmental health. But what is often it was less spoken about is the of the synergies within the SDG. So before we even talk about uh, FD, um, synergies between uh, climate and SDGs, from a health perspective, um, there's often missed opportunities for thinking about health across the SDGs. So um, you, you mentioned about the VNRs earlier. So there's been some work uh, to look at uh, the ways that health and well-being manifest across the VNRs. And, and the too long don't read um, <laughs> summary is that it's still quite siloed. Um, there, is, there is still um, a siloing of thinking about health as health care. Um, but one, one of the really critical challenges that have been identified uh, to, uh, to reporting on health across the VNRs is health information systems. So within the context of strengthening health um, health systems. So I'll park that for a moment. I'll come back to that. On the other side, we have the um, the, cl uh, the climate side of things, of thinking about health and climate. Now, I think it's been quite uh, phenomenal in the last couple of years just how much progress we've made in shifting the the narrative around um, health being critical, addressing health as being critical to climate action, about around the climate crisis as being a public health crisis. You know, this is, I think it shouldn't be underplayed, right? Um, because it's been a remarkable shift in the, in the, mm -hmm. um, in the narrative, which is, which is a significant um, um, advance. Now, <clears throat> the equivalent of the VNR um, in, on the climate side is uh, are the NDCs, as you mentioned. And uh, my, my shorthand way of thinking about it is, is, is asking how, how much NCDs are in NDCs, um, <laughs> um, which is non-communicable non diseases. Just as a shorthand, not because that, those are the only group of diseases, but um, there's been some work looking at uh, the uh, health in the NDCs and the extent to which um, um, health is con uh, considered across the NDCs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the striking observations is, and this comes to the the, the question you asked, or the the provocation you mentioned around equity and a just transition. One of the most striking observations from that report, which is by the Global Climate and Health Alliance, is that the countries that are doing the best at um, integrating health into the NDCs are the more resource constrained countries. So they um, they look at 
um, health with respect to integrated governance. So to what extent is health, uh, is the health sector part of the um, discussion and, and planning and implementation of, of NDCs and look at the whether to what extent the health impacts are considered very explicitly, um, health negative impacts, but also health co-benefits. They look at economics and finance. So how 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 um, are the NDCs considering health in those spaces and really critically looking at monitoring and value and, uh, and implementation. And really that the fact that uh, Australia and Japan and New Zealand feature right at the bottom of that in terms of integration. But Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and, and much more re resource constrained centres feature quite highly in terms of the degree of integration says a lot. And I think that the what it says is to me is that this is this is really obvious. And that in terms of in terms of accelerating action, we absolutely have to um, Align our, align our efforts because it's at, at worst, at best is a waste of resources. At worst, we really not set out to achieve um, the goals, either the health goals or the climate goals by, um, by 2030. Now, maybe just to, just to end with thinking a little bit about um, um, looking ahead, um, Apart from, I want to mention two quick things. Totally One on the looking again, we will have an opportunity to come back to that round in terms of um, forward-looking perspectives. Okay, then I'll end with, and I'll end with something, <laughs> end with something else. So I think um, I do think it's important to consider, and, and when we start talking about um, uh, climate and health. I th um, climate and SDGs, I beg your pardon. Uh, it's important that we don't end up creating two new silos, right? Um, because the climate policies and the SDGs policies are very circumscribed. And I'll come back when we start thinking about the way forward to think about that. But I do think it's important that we are still systematically and systemically thinking about, even as we seek to integrate these two, um, these two uh, global policy uh, topics. Thank you, Talula. And I think your point about health having done quite a bit of work and succeeding and at um, sort of being integrated across these two agendas is important. And I'm sure um, your contribution to the report with the co-leads is, is really important on the health issue, given that this is a really success story compared to, let's say, some, other, some of the other SDGs. Um, and your point about the integration of health vis-a-vis -vis NDCs is a good segue, I think, for Addis. You've done a lot of work with the NDCs and how much SDGs, um, how, how SDGs are being integrated in the NDCs or not being integrated. Please, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bahar. <clears throat> First, uh, before I go into my pre-prepared statement, uh, uh, a clarification on the VNR and NDCs. Uh, so, and why they are complementing uh, uh, so, so well, because VNRs are backward looking, while NDCs are more forward looking. And uh, one kind of clear recommendation that I hope the report will come to is that um, formalizing these two processes in, in, in actively seeking these interactions will, all, will give you an, uh, an evidence of what kind of outcomes have been come so far and also what kind of processes will be uh, developed in the future. Uh, but yeah, so from kind of my point of view, so climate and SDG synergies have been uh, explored since both agendas were technically established in, in 2015. So there's a wealth of knowledge to already build on. And, and some of the early work that I have uh, uh, contributed to has, has looked at NDC specifically and, and analyzing how kind of activities in, within, within the NDCs are contributing to the broad, broad spectrum of the, of the 2030 agenda. And, and uh, uh, we found that through the uh, multiple publications, but also the, the online tool, the NDC SD Connections, that we see the climate action is really uh, a, a kind of broad and has strong connections to all 17 goals to, to various contexts. And, and more recently, we have updated this analysis by providing a kind of a comparison between the kind of first round of NDCs and the updated uh, documents that have been published more recently and found that these connections uh, are technically stre uh, strengthening uh, over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this work and, and also as, as well as many others have shown that climate and sustainable development are, uh, are strongly linked, but it, this is being done in a very ad hoc uh, uh, 
process without any kind of formal formalization. And, and as seen here, this was a very good hands up uh, session. It's not only different, different cities and different negotiators, but also different participants. So of course, if, if, if there are two groups of communities that are not talking with each other globally, uh, how can we expect countries to do that? Uh, so this is kind of a, 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 key, a key question that uh, warrants more exploration. But also despite the, the fact that there are these connections and interactions, if we look at uh, policy objectives, it doesn't mean that all countries are giving proportional emphasis to, let's say, the kind of three dimensions of sustainable development, so environmental and economic and, and, and social. And just to bring one example, while SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy is the one that the SDG that is strongly prioritized in, 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 in NDCs. For example, uh, countries are not really putting much effort into ensuring affordable and, 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 uh, and, and, and energy access for, for all. And even if you extrapolate to uh, countries in the global south or particularly vulnerable countries, we still see that target 7.1 7 is much less prioritized than other targets on, on uh, scaling up renewable energy, on, on, on energy efficiency. Uh, another finding is also that uh, while we see that all, all goals are being uh, related within uh, countries' climate policies, uh, activities that are more targeted towards the social dimensions, for example, SDGs 1 and 5 and 10, are more written in very general terms, very kind of vague, uh, without any, uh, any kind of measurable or quantifiable targets, while uh, many other goals in, in the economic dimensions, for example, energy, but also in the environmental one around scaling up irrig irrigation are much more clear, clearly stated, more targe targeted and, and, and quantifiable. So there is a big disc discrepancy in, in that sense. Um, yeah, just quickly, another strand of work that we have uh, looked at have been just exploring which kind of SD SDG targets are most relevant from, from when looking at it from a, from a climate lens and trying to explore are these synergetic if we provide a boundary of, of, of one and a half degrees. So we have used, um, oh, I'm losing my time, sorry. The, um, uh, the, the IPCC one and a half degree scenario to see are, this, are these objectives achievable. And overall, there is strong kind of, looking at the policy objectives themselves, such as the targets, there is a strong synergetic potential. Uh, but at the same time, when you try to go beyond what is being proposed, what is being formulated, we see that this is not, not really happening. And I don't have that much time to go into our national level uh, insight, but there is a similar level of finding that there are policies are defined that you can seek, find synergies and you should be able to implement them, but that's not really happening uh, on the ground. So uh, yeah, we see that uh, the way we are perceiving this problem is that efforts at increasing uh, policy coherence and dissents are really failing to emphasize the political nature of the, both the processes and the outcomes um, and prescribing technical solutions to, to what is largely a political problem will not solve the issue of uh, how the fossil fuel lobby, for example, has stronger access to decision-making processes than, than other groups or what kind of political debate and, and political ideology is governing decision-making in, in the country. So, there is a role to kind of exploring and expanding that aspect on how policy coherence is being undertaken, uh, both globally and at the national level. Thanks. Thank you, Addison. Let me pick up on your point about um, NDCs and an opportunity to integrate issues that are critical and related to climate but are not being addressed, energy access, right? So the recent report on um, SDG 7 came out and there's still 660 million people who don't have access to electricity and 1.9 billion people are still without clean cooking solutions. Both are related to climate. One can argue energy access, lack of electricity is also related to adaptation and the whole clean cooking issue could be related to um, GHG emission reduction, but none of them are being reflected in the NDCs. A missed opportunity and we're still lagging behind on these targets as well um, as part of SDG 7. Um, so now, Claire, over to you. You've done a lot of work also on the long-term scenarios, 1.5. Um, how is this conversation around synergies with the SDGs coming into your work? 
Thank you. Um, you've actually just completely stolen my first point that I was going to make, which is so coming from a science and energy system perspective, um, I think the first point is really that we're, we're far off track on, on both counts. So, of course, we have this huge emissions gap in 2030 that we need to close. Otherwise, we head for extremely dangerous levels of warming. And on the other hand, taking as an example SG, SDG 7, we're very far off track with yeah, 670 odd million still without access um, to electricity. And we know, I mean, the science is very clear that renewables offer the fairest, the most future-proof, the safest, the cleanest options for accelerating energy access and addressing climate change. And worryingly, this IRENA research has shown that still public um, finance, public international finance um, for clean energy in low and middle income countries has actually declined since um, before the pandemic. So I think, yeah, we, we see an urgent need to to shift where finance is flowing. And um, I think one, one thing I wanted to address was um, that despite this evidence on the power of renewables and really the acceleration that we're seeing there, we're still hearing, um, for example, claims that fossil gas would be um, a good option for um, achieving SDG 7. And I mean, the evidence shows that, that this really isn't the case. Um, in a world where we limit warming to 1.5, um, fossil gas in the power sector needs to phase out very soon after coal, actually, and it, in the, by the early 2040s, um, and we see very substantial declines already this decade. Um, and in some of the work that we at Climate Analytics have done, we've shown what synergies actually phasing out fossil gas could have for um, some SDGs, in particular health. We looked at um, a power, um, a fossil... Um, gas power plant phase out schedule for South Korea um, and we looked from two perspectives looking at integrating um, how best to reduce emissions on the one hand but also on the, on the other hand how best to lower air pollution and the associated um, deaths and health risks from air pollution and what we saw very clearly is the synergies between the two um, the major climate culprits, the major plants that were really dirty for climate were also major health culprits. Um, and so if you, if you designed a phase out schedule um, to actually benefit health and prioritize health, you'd have huge climate benefits as well. So this was a really nice example of how integrating the two can lead to, I think, really powerful messages also for policymakers. And yeah, maybe just a, a final point there. We talk a lot about the synergies of climate action uh, for the SDGs. I think it's also important to think about the risks for the SDGs of continued um, use of continued reliance on fossil fuels. And I don't just mean from climate impacts. Of course, climate impacts pre present a very serious risk for sustainable development, but there's also uh, risks of a disorderly transition, risks of stranded assets, risks of fossil fuel lock-in. If governments are lured into making uh, investments in, for example, fossil gas infrastructure, um, they could be, end up saddled with debt, saddled with very different transitions, ultimately saddled with um, high costs of maintaining and ultimately decommissioning that infrastructure as fossil fuel demand dries up. Um, and so, yeah, I think, it's I think this shows that really an integrated perspective on climate and the SDGs shows how we need to go beyond short-term thinking. Um, we need to think into that longer term of what our actions mean for both and also considering the opportunity costs of, um, of yeah, not pursuing a climate-friendly energy transition. Thanks, Claire. And that last point um, is extremely important. The UN Secretary General came out earlier this, day, this year saying climate action is the biggest opportunity in the 21st century for advancing the SDGs. And I think the reverse is true as well. Lack of action on climate is one of the most major risks in achieving the SDGs. And how do we um, quantify that better so that we facilitate policymakers' decisions when they have to navigate between the synergies and also the trade-offs, which is something that you highlighted. And Christy, over to you as our uh, youth delegate. How do you see um, this coming in in the conversations within the different youth groups on climate and SDG? Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. And um, it is my pleasure to be uh, part of this dialogue. Um, my work is focusing more on helping the corporate company to better develop their like decarbonization strategy and how to align with their country NDC as well. So the common frustration in our daily life is like 
we feel powerless, like distant and heavy, like whenever we hear the word like just transition. Um, in the fact that a lot of people, like especially I'm from Hong Kong, I hear a lot about like climate change or just transition. But then the fact is that like we find out there's a huge gap between like the awareness and the action uh, between like just transition. We also like require like a systematic like change and how we promote sustainable investment, how we um, like invest more in renewable energy instead of fossil, uh, like fossil fuel and really like high carbon incentive like uh, the different energy. So um, how we communicate like just uh, transition to different stakeholders is a really big issue and currently there's a lack of like uh, action and implementation plan. So to make um, such a deep like systematic change, transparency and data accessibility is a really key component. And speaking like more like financial perspective, um, here we'd like to bring one example in the Just Transition um, Initiative in Hong Kong. So a Hong Kong based uh, social enterprise is called Bu uh, Onion. So they um, actually a profit for purpose um, like company. Um, they aim to like bring the best practices uh, within this um, like financial ecosystem, like uh, like to while like exploring like different green or blue or whatever color like washing behavior. So they connect the buy side and also like the sell side investment product, provide platform to actually like um, cater the investor and the gatekeeper to value like what is sustainability and what is like crucial in investment um, like criteria. So this platform is really like important for all the like ethical manager to actually like award their talk instead of like just invest in something that is really high polluted uh, in the world right now. So I think like uh, like bringing this up, like transparency to bring all the data on the table to assess to everyone to like show the impact um, investment is quite important and how to streamline all the data um, like due diligence and also like how we connect with the uh, policymaker and also like sustainable manager is quite important that um, how to link with the SDG co-benefit. So this is one point that um, um, we have to bring it out on the table uh, in the investment side and also how as a youth to advocate more on like how to push the corporate company to do more. And this also one of the, uh, what is climate justice is not a term, but it's more like movement and how we Hong Kong policy and also uh, we actually uh, push more on investing in uh, renewable energy and also like uh, how to uh, uh, like start the social dialogue to help different stakeholders to raise their concern. And this is how youth, um, our demand want to like show to, um, to, to the policy maker as well. Yeah. Thank you, Christy, for that very concrete example from um, Hong Kong and the lessons that can be captured from it. Um, now let me uh, turn again to Kave and we'll do that. We have roughly 20 minutes. So this, the, the next 20 minutes, I want to focus it on um, if, if Luis and the team are putting together a very concise set of forward-looking recommendations that could go into the COP and into the um, SDG-related processes, what would they be? Kave, over to you. Thanks, Bahari. Um, Lewis, you're going to have to have an annex for all of my, my <laughs> Christmas uh, wish list of things. So, I mean, I think the one thing uh, that this process can do, the, the climate process that we all know and love, it, it can send very clear normative signals to the world as to what needs to be done. That's its, its overarching um, sort of superpower. And in that context, and building on one, some of the things that we've already heard, I mean, I took the example, if a country has a long-term strategy to achieve net zero emissions and it actually does what's necessary then that is essentially its development plan and the NDC should be seen in the context of five yearly documents that that take or commitments that take countries towards that in the areas of adaptation mitigation and means of implementation so I mean looking at that I think specific things that we could ask for that's normative from this process the COP28 outcome could recommend that uh, that countries talk about N SDG implementation in their NDCs, their national adaptation plans and communications, their long-term strategies. Uh, the, there could be an invitation for countries to do that as they look to come forward with NDCs in 2025. The guidance for NDCs will be um, 
will be reviewed and updated in the next couple of years, so the guidance could be much more uh, directive on that. The opportunities um, for SDG alignment should be highlighted in the global stock take outcome. A number of delegates mentioned in the technical dialogue process the importance of that, so hopefully that will be reflected in the synthesis report and also the political outcome from the uh, global stock take process. The uh, SDG should be a key part of the ministerial discussions that will be convened at this COP and every other COP, so that should be a lens that we should look through this at. I would say that there should be a clear call in the COP28 outcome for the UN system to align. I can say that as a former uh, part of the UN system. Uh, Luis as well, I'm sure, would have a lot to say about that. But for example, UNDP is doing a huge amount of work that could be drawn upon through its climate promise and on the SDGs in over 140 countries. That needs to be aligned with the climate regime. Um, there's the question of information and data and reporting. There could be a streamlining of the reporting requirements for NDCs and the VNRs, for example. Uh, but also, there's a lot of data there that's being held by the Climate um, Secretariat. And as the Enhanced Transparency Framework kicks in under the Paris Agreement, there could be um, synergies there that could be brought out, but also there's a huge capacity building need. Mm -hmm. Many countries don't have any system for data collection, so how do we know how they're doing? So that could be a key recommendation. Almost finished here with my list, uh, Luis. I hope you're getting all of these down. Um, the ongoing mandates, the, um, the mandates on the new goal on finance, the mitigation work program, the global goal adaptation, the just transition work program, SCDs should be put at the heart of those and also the work of the Transitional Committee on Loss and Damage. Mm -hmm. The COP should strengthen the call for MDB and IFI reform, specifically talking about moving uh, financial flows from these institutions in the right direction to enhance both development and, uh, and climate action. And then the final thing I would say, again, I would reiterate that the, the, the UNFCCC Executive Secretary is talking about COP uh, of 2024 being the year of response to the outcomes of the global stock take. And also there's this notion of enhanced international cooperation, which is in the mandate of the global stock take. I think we need to think about what that means through the SDG lens mm -hmm. uh, and really have a, a sort of all of the UN system, all of government approach to responding to the global stock take outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Kaveh, extremely helpful. And I think we could, we could write a report only on this topic about how to inject the SDGs within the climate negotiations, where are the opportunities and so on. And so I advocate for uh, maybe not an annex, even expand, extended um, chapter or something of that sort. But um, coming back um, to Lula, over to you. Uh, what would be some top recommendations from your side? Yeah, thanks. So in terms of picking up on the momentum, I do think that um, there's some low-hanging fruit here. So I alluded to health as a really important low-hanging fruit, and it's really encouraging to see that the elevation of health in this year's COP28 coming up. Um, that could be, we're talking about it as health and climate, but we're still not talking about that as SDGs and climate. <laughs> um, and so, and, and I think that is, a, that is an impo important opportunity that we can, we can leverage. Um, but in, in order for the vision and implementation to be aligned, we do need better um, integrated um, governance, as uh, the previous speaker alluded. I would add to the um, global policy alignment, uh, UNDP, there's also UN Habitat that has aspects on healthy public space that isn't somehow as separate from this climate and health, but it's really critical. The WHO's general program of work has promoting health is really critical, and most of those, those sectors lie outside of healthcare and have this intersection with, with climate um, um, eco-vulnerability. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but I want to highlight uh, two key ones. One is around finance, one is around data integration. So in thinking about how, when we talk about climate financing, in a sense that that phrase itself has already been siloed in a sense, rather than we're talking about financing for um, mitigation and for adaptation, 
so if we look at something like the, the urban uh, sector, so I, a lot of my work is focused on cities, and that's really important from the emissions perspective, because we know most of the, the emissions um, globally uh, are in cities. Um, there's some there's some evidence that uh, we've been working on the last few years as part of the uh, Pathfinders Emission looking um, Commission, looking at evidence of uh, the uh, evidence that exists on the health impacts of climate mitigation actions. And there's some very obvious things like pathways that involve um, environment and, uh, that influence the way we move, so mobility, air pollution, and food systems. We know that these are really critical for several SDGs as well as for climate goals, and those tag on to key. Uh, sectors. So the transport sector is a really a good example of, of why we need to be deliberate about um, consciously uh, integrating uh, um, health in both climate and SDGs. You know, I like to say health doesn't trickle down from good intentions. You know, you can say something like we want a green, we want greener transport infrastructure. Um, and that involves getting more people of single car use to mass transport, but it, uh, mass transit. But if you're not thinking about uh, the impact on on the uh, quality of the air, then you are reducing emissions in terms of getting people off the road, but you are not necessarily. Um, sufficiently um, improving population health because you're not thinking about air pollution. So these are kind of very good examples, very easy examples of how um, how this, this uh, conscious approach is to thinking about the matter. So if we look at financing of urban infrastructure, for example, I, I still find that a lot of uh, climate and green funding is still siloed as green funding. Um, you know, uh, one of the colleagues mentioned earlier around the role of um, um, development finance institutions, the same institutions that are funding and financing a lot of the large urban infrastructure projects, they have climate financing and then they have urban, or urban infrastructure. Why are they different? Your, your goals have to be aligned. So I think it's really important that we're not just talking about climate finance and that we're thinking about these sectoral finances of these um, kind of urban, urban uh, large scale projects, particularly in places that, where the expenditure is yet to happen. And then the last point is on the data integration. This is something that is common both in terms of um, uh, the SDGs and, and the climate, uh, and the climate uh, goals. The ability to monitor the effect of what any intervention is really critical. In that work that we did um, on the Pathfinders Commission, a lot of the a lot of the work is modelled, which is good to some extent. But when you have an absence of data, we have to measure the impact of our of, of any intervention that we're setting up, and that requires stronger, um, more intersectoral data systems. Whether that's from the health sector, whether that's from the transport sector. So looking at capacity strengthening, which is one of the um, pathways for the uh, for the Paris Agreement, not just in terms of climate, but in terms of data um, information systems is, is absolutely vital. Thank you, Tolula. And again, finance, one of those important topics that can also easily have its own reports, looking at the funds related to the climate process, the GCF, the GEF, but also looking at bilateral MDBs and the flow on finance in general and how um, these two topics, climate action and the SDGs, are coming together. Um, Addis, over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, I'll just start by saying a few words about the potential for just transition for increasing interactions, and then I'll end up with, end with uh, some of the kind of term things that are needed from a policy oriented perspective. That is my area of research. So yeah, starting to with just transition, uh, it, it, it's a it's a thematical fr framework that could increase synergies between climate and sustainable development if it is used in the right way. And, and, and also we are seeing in our work on NDC SDU connections that in, in the updated NDCs there are more uh, mentioning of, 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 of just transition and we are even seeing it as one of the key emerging topics uh, uh, in a policy brief that will be published in a, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, just transition is kind of a novel concept in the climate discourse. The, the, the topic of climate justice has been here for a long time, for decades uh, actually, and it's an essential element of climate policy. So, and the debate on climate justice has um, increasingly given rise to a stronger push for, for just transition uh, in the sense of trying to combine the, the protection of workers' rights with uh, uh, environmental, social and economic sustainability. So, it's important to remember the roots of just transition as being something that sprung out of the labor movement uh, and it's ultimately at its core about labor rights. So, it's 
focusing on the kind of high level interaction like the, the climate and SDG negotiations, I'd say it's important not to kind of assign all your hopes and dreams into it. And I was attending a few sessions last week uh, where people were just adding whatever they wanted to uh, just transition. So it's important that, that this does not get out of hand. And I would give an example from the past few years has been loss and damage. Uh, a concept that basically just took over the whole discourse and uh, was basically intended to save everything, but at the same time kind of concealing the, the needed discussion on why is there not enough mobilized and delivered adaptation finance. So yeah, that's, that's kind of one of the insights on that. So a narrow framework with more clear and measurable goals uh, is crucial for, for ensuring that just transition as a framework could be successful in increasing interactions. And these goals need to emphasize the social aspects of uh, sustainable development, including inequality and gender and poverty. These need to be at the core of, of what just transition should be. Uh, yeah, and in terms of from a kind of policy coherence perspective, uh, as mentioned multiple times, ensuring formalized, formalized processes of NDCs and VNRs is, is, a, is a good start, starting point. But also there needs to be a clear recognition that starting at the global level, that the level of economic development is not a reflection of uh, more coherent processes and outcomes. So this is an issue that, is, uh, that all countries are, are, are grappling with. And also, while more stronger focus on policy coherence can uh, lead to more effective policy outcomes, it does not necessarily mean that it will improve issues around social dimensions, such as uh, decreasing inequality. And uh, some of our more recent research has actually even shown that even if you have effective uh, outcomes, they still can tend to increase uh, inequality. So yeah, so not considering negative consequences of climate and sustainable de development policies and what trade-offs they cause, it can risk distracting from difficult political conversations around which groups bear the burden of climate and sustainable development policies. And, and in, in a sense, it can be more detrimental for making progress if, if it's not incorporating a, a broader perspective. Um, so yeah, summarize, I would say goals are often de designed in a way that can be implemented coherently, but more efforts need to be put in, in developing uh, policy instruments that better account for these trade-offs and also monitoring and, and, and evaluation uh, systems to assure outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Addis. I'm told I have a hard timeline of 2.30 to end. So um, Claire, over to you. You have two minutes and then Chrissy, two minutes to you. Okay, thank you. So I would say three things from kind of an analytical perspective. One is we need more granular information. I think there's a lot of general analysis out there, but we really need to dive down into specific power plants, specific types of jobs that could benefit from the transition. How long will they last? What kind of skills are needed? What kind of training is needed? And that's something that we're trying to incorporate into our analysis now. The second one is I think the models that we use to understand pathways to net zero could better incorporate sustainable development goals and benefits. Um, some are starting to do this and generally show, for example, faster demand reduction in the developed world. Um, but I think that's an area um, where we can improve. And the third one is I think not losing sight of the fact that what we do this decade in climate will really affect what we can do in sustainable development for decades to come. Um, if, we, if we halve emissions by 2030 as needed for 1.5, we could halve warming rates in the 2030s and 2040s and that buys incredibly important time for adapting and also of course limits our likelihood of passing very dangerous tipping points. So I think it all comes back to um, really closing that emissions gap in 2030 and enhancing uh, the NDCs. Thanks, Claire. Christy. Thank you. Um, to enhance like synergy, like as a youth, like um, we have different working group, like actually in, um, like uh, advocate in different like perspective, and then like for example, like especially women and uh, vulnerable group, like into I think these are seven like really key area that we have to look into, like for example, like protecting their well being, and also like how to like stabilizing their living, and also like how to provide it their uh, have a really judge uh, just um, and also like how to access to the information is quite important. And also like how to adjust the work environment, especially to the global self, how they can uh, help them to do a different like arrangement and improve their like local transportation. That's also one of the key support for the community level. And in particular, like how to um, build a framework to uh, make an equitable partnership. 
And this is a really key important uh, element that we also like really um, advocate on this area, like the information to um, different uh, vulnerable group. Um, they, they need the information to know how to access to uh, get the information to what is like climate, um, like the extreme weather event happen, and also how they can um, like enhance their education in the general public. That's all um, like how to share the resources and build a partnership. Thank you so much. Um, so that ends the um, panel discussion. Thank you so much to the co-leads, Luis and Heidi, for the presentation. And thanks to the panel experts for the rich discussion here. Um, in terms of how you can engage in this conversation and in, for immediate opportunities, um, two things. One, um, as Luis mentioned, there's an opportunity to integrate um, examples from across the world, whether you're part of the national delegation or your institution is looking at this issue, do come to us. We would like to know about those examples um, as we look uh, deeper into this um, issue. And secondly, um, as Daniela mentioned, the fourth global conference on climate and SDG synergies is taking place um, on July 16 in New York. Um, this is a part of uh, what we call the high-level political forum. It's part of the SDG sort of uh, process. We are bringing this conversation um, on climate action and how it facilitates the achievement of the SDGs into that process. Um, so um, there is a website for that. Uh, you can register. Um, it is in person, but it will be um, also webcasted, so if you're interested in following virtually, that's an opportunity. And as we move on, um, ahead towards the next milestones, the SDG Summit is happening um, in September in New York. That is when we hope to launch this report. Um, and then, of course, uh, we will be at the COP. Uh, we usually have a dedicated pavilion on the SDGs where uh, we try to um, demonstrate how climate and SDG synergies are coming together. Um, it is um, sort of um, open to uh, those attending the COP. And um, if you are interested in also um, having a side event, there, that's an opportunity. So stay engaged. Come talk to us um, if you uh, would like to participate in these upcoming opportunities. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.